Hello, I'm Nick Herriman, author of the book entitled The Entangled State. Welcome to 25 Concepts in Anthropology. In this series we look through the 25 concepts which provide a unique insight into the question of what it is to be human. Now one concept which helps us more than any perhaps is the idea of religion. So if we ask what it is to be human, one of the answers is, well, it is to be religious. And what is it to be religious? Well, the crux of what is to be religious, we can see, is to treat corpses in a special way. In other words, Homo sapiens sapiens are the only animal that treats their corpses in a specific and special way. We might be burning them or storing them in a special place or burying them, but we think that's one of the unique things. And in fact, the word humus might, hum, human might come from the Latin humus, meaning earth. In other words, um, corpses are placed in the earth. And in Australia, some of the earliest evidence we have about 30, 40,000 years ago uh, of human skeletons with, buried with ochre, that's a kind of red, um, red clay used for painting faces and walls and so on. So it seems that uh, at least from 30, 40,000 years ago we started um, treating corpses in a special way in my country, Australia. Now, to understand religion, we firstly have to see that uh, all humans are religious. Even people who say, I am a skeptic or uh, I believe in science. Well, for us, that is a kind of religion. In other words, what religion means to us is not so much a belief in a supernatural being, but a belief in what's really real, what underlies everything, what's, what's really important for us. So to discuss this, I'm going to look at three different kinds of societies. I'm going to look at a hunter-gatherer society, I'm going to look at a Sweden cultivating society, and I'm going to look at a peasant society to get a broader or better understanding of religion and hopefully thus what it is to be human. And while I look through these, I'm going to look at not just the supernatural elements, which are quite interesting and exciting, but also I'm going to try and look at other elements of the story, which are uh, political, economic, and uh, implications in the realm of ideas. So let's start with the first society. We're going to look at Australian Aboriginal societies, Indigenous Australian societies. I'm going to take the example of uh, the tr uh, groups from the Northern Territory in Australia. And one of the st stories that comes from these groups is the story of Guriala, which I'll also put on YouTube later. Now Guriala was the rainbow serpent. And back in the dream time, that's the t we're going to be talking about this now, the dream time or the dreaming, the world was flat and there were only our ancestors and Guriala. And Guriala travelled through the country and with his body he made the hills and waterholes, rivers and canyons we see today. Guriala was travelling through his country trying to find his people. And finally he found his own tribe and he showed the men how to dance. Suddenly a huge storm was developing and two brothers called Rainbow Lorikeet. Now Rainbow Lorikeet for Australians is a uh, very colourful bird. Two animals called Rainbow Lorikeet uh, were, travel were running around trying to find shelter from the storm and Guriala said, you can hop in my humpy. Humpy is a, um, a kind of house. You can hop in my humpy. And he opened up his mouth and Rainbow Lorikeet brothers ran into his mouth and he swallowed them. Well, he realised everybody in the tribe would be angry and try and catch him, so he slithered away the next day. And everybody in the tribe indeed come, came to chase him. And he climbed up the highest mountain. And nobody could climb up to get the, the two brothers out of his tummy. But then the Goanna brothers, Goanna's are good at climbing, the Goanna brothers, Goanna is a lizard by the way, big lizard, Goanna brothers climbed up the mountain, cut open Guriala's tummy, and out flew the Rainbow Lorikeet brothers. They had turned into animals. The ancestors had turned into an animal, the Rainbow Lorikeet. When Guriala awoke, he was so furious he started um, uh, shuddering and, 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 and shaking. And as he did that, the mountain fell to pieces and bits of rock flew everywhere. And that formed the hills that we know today. And the ancestors were so frightened, they started running away. And the emu ancestors turned into emu. The fly ancestors turned into fly, etc, etc, etc. 
And finally, Guriala went in and created the ocean. End of story. So this is what you call a Dreamtime story. And for Aboriginal groups in Australia, uh, these were the centre of religion. The reason why they call it the Dreaming is, is various. We think partly because uh, the Dreamtime was the period of the ancestors, my ancestors, your ancestors, and through dreaming we have a connection with that period. We can actually dream and make a connection with that period. Also those ancestors themselves, before they changed shape from human to animal form, they were humans but they were also superhumans, they could do incredible feats. Uh, but before they changed into human form, often they would dream at first. Now, although it seems like um, sort of in the Judeo-Christian era a sense of a very distant past that's separate from now, for Australian Aboriginal people the dream time is very much connected with the present. Yeah, um, so if this, if, if for example the, the hills in the background, I don't know if you can see them, were created by Guriala, well Guriala is still there. Parts of Guriala are there. And if I was born there, that is where I am. I am that hill. If I say I, I refer to this thing here, this body you see in front of you, as well as that hill right in the background. I hope you can see it. Guriala is that hill and I am Guriala. And one day I will be the ancestors for my descendants. And my grand grandfather, grand and grandfather are also connected with the dreaming with the ancestor. And if I have scars where I'm initiated on me, these can be connected with the ancestors too. So it's not like something very distant, it's something very, uh, very much present. Now anthropologists are kind of interested in these stories just as they are, but we're interested in them more than just for their stories. We're interested in what they do. For example, these dreaming stories are stories of the superhuman ancestors who created the world. But they're also the stories of totems. Some people will be an emu totem, which is a certain group within a tribe. Some people will be uh, a goanna totem. Some people will be rainbow lorikeet totem. And maybe, I'm not sure, but some people might be rainbow serpent totem. And this will determine how you interact and how you marry and so on. So it has a social dimension. Anthropology, as I suggested, is holistic. We look at things in terms of the larger context of the whole society, but also in larger international contexts. And now things like the Dreamtime stories are very important. This connection with the land um, has political and economic implications. If somebody wants to build, for example, a, uh, a large development on that hill over there, it might risk disturbing the spirit that was there the ancestral spirit that was there. So in order to get a, a development to go ahead, they have to check with local indigenous people as to whether there's a dreaming story associated with that part of land. So this is a larger picture that anthropologists are particularly interested in. Okay, that was my first example. It was an example from a, a hunter-gathering society. Now I want to look at a Sweden society. And for this, I'm going to look at the Wana of Sulawesi. Sulawesi is an island uh, formerly known as the Celebes in Indonesia and there's a group there that's a Sweden cultivating. As, as you know, Sweden cultivating means slash and burn. And slash and burn means you uh, chop down this tree and burn it, wait for the rain to wash in the, uh, the nutrients to fertilize the soil, then I plant some seeds and let something else grow there, like uh, papaya or whatever I want to grow. And once I finish here, I move on to another plot about a mile down there, then another plot the year after that, a mile over there, etc, etc. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not as extensive as, as, um, as hunter-gathering, but it's still extensive. Now, the people of Sulawesi, some of them are, are Sweden cultivators, including the Wana. And the Wana uh, have a belief that everything is falling to pieces. And this, this belief is close to my kind of religious beliefs. Uh, from in my religion, which is a, say a Western religion, we believe that the family is very important, but there are kinds of there are always risks for the family that risk tearing it to pieces, drugs, uh, the internet, television, whatever it is. We see as risking um, the in integration of the, of the of the family, and we, we see a need for, of ritual to bring the family together. An example of that is that when I was a boy, it was thought to be very important that families should eat dinners together, that this would bind or 
or make families cohesive. And especially things like Christmas meals or Thanksgiving meals are important to draw the family together. Now for the Wana, they have a similar belief that there's a risk that things will fall to pieces. The whole universe might fall to pieces. The whole society risks falling to pieces. And even individual selves risk um, becoming disintegrated. And I think in Western society we have a similar sense that sometimes if, if different parts of your personality aren't linked up properly of your mind, that you will, will go crazy and get sick. Well, it's the same for the Wana or similar, let's say, for the Wana. There's a sense of everything falling to pieces. Now, they have one ritual called the Mabolong ritual. The Mabolong ritual makes things come back together. And in this ritual, it's a bit like this. If I'm feeling sick, I go to a shaman. A shaman is a, is a person who leaves his or her body to communicate directly with the ancestors and spirits and then to work out what's wrong with you and to heal you. So I go to a shaman and say, look, I'm falling to pieces. And he says, right, we'll have a Mabolong ritual, which brings together all my family and most of the group. And during this ritual, as I suggested, he'll leave his body. And he'll find out from the ancestors or the spirits what's pulling me to pieces and reintegrate me. This also has the function of reintegrating the group and also the whole universe. In other words, there's a very big responsibility for this shaman. If he makes a mistake or gets it wrong, the chances everything could fall to pieces. So in the same way the Mabolong ritual brings together uh, the individual self, the group, and the universe. When I was a young boy, it was believed that rituals such as dinners, uh, the evening meal, in particular and Christmas meals brought the family together. Now again we, we don't just see these as interesting stories for, by themselves but we also look at the larger framework. Um, Atkinson who did the research on this suggests that um, it's important for the shaman's own status to do a good performance, a good ritual in order to elevate his own status. And so there's uh, political elements to it there's also economic elements to it, in fact, because it's um, Sweden or shifting cultivation or slash and burn, they're all the same thing. Uh, there is a risk of groups getting separated. So this is a, fo a force which does tend to create coherence. There are other elements which are psychological, which I won't go into now, but you can read about in the source or the reference I'll give you. Okay, we've looked at two societies now, hunter-gatherer, Sweden cultivator, and the last one we're going to look at is a peasant society from near where I do field work, a village that's very different to my fieldwork village, a village called Bayou in Far East Java. Now, Bayou village was founded by Buyut. Buyut means grand, great-grandfather, something like that. Buyut is an ancestral spirit now, and he still exists, he still lives around Bayou. And he has a pet, and that pet is Barong. And Barong is a bit like a, a dragon. It's like one of those Chinese dragons you see on Chinese New Year's and at weddings. Barong needs to be humoured, needs to be brought out every year. So men will go in, pull out the Barong, and the Barong becomes alive, a living being. And then you humour it with performances and perhaps also uh, present it with um, certain offerings. And if Barong, this, doing this pleases Buyut, the elder, the ancestral spirit, and Buyut will therefore ensure the fertility and the continued success of Bayou village. So it's important to do this ritual. Now, there are other dances, uh, other rituals too. One is called the Siblang, which takes the form of a, a dance a young girl who has just reached fertility, in other words, has just started menstruating, uh, becomes possessed by spirits, local spirits, who make her, make her dance, and it's a very erotic dance that she does. And um, again, this is all associated with the fertility of the village. So there are spirits that need to be appeased, or propitiated is the word, and given offerings. Again, uh, anthropologists just aren't interested in, in, in in a simple sense, like the 
the exoticism of these stories. We're not interested in the exotic so much as actually making it seem more familiar, more understand, more understandable. Um, and part of this, is we have to suspend our moral judgments. For some people, a 14-year-old girl dancing sexily um, in our culture might be seen as quite inappropriate. But once it's seen within the um, the prism of this culture where, for example, it's not uncommon for 16-year-old girls to get married. That's thought of as a normal age for various reasons, including economic reasons. Um, we, we, we can at least understand it better. So we don't judge it straight away. We at least seek to understand it. And we're also interested in this, uh, these uh, sort of spirit rituals because they reflect on the status of Islam. So Islam is a missionary uh, religion, so it's spreading through Java, and it's coming in, in conflict with these uh, sort of local religions, like the religion of Bayou, because uh, the practices in Bayou are perceived from a sort of a puritanical Islamic perspective as being shirk, or uh, I can't think of the word right now, um, anyway, worshipping, not worshipping God. Okay. So, again, we're not interested in these stories just, and these rituals, just as they, for themselves, but for what they say about the politics, economy, and ideas in that society. So, the important thing to think, just to realise is that for anthropologists, uh, religion, as for example, defined as the belief in the supernatural, is really not enough. We're interested in much more than that. And really, I think most humans think that if you just toss away a corpse, as sometimes happens in wars, etc., that this is very inhuman. In other words, one of the most hum humane things, if you like, one of the most significant things about what it is to be human is to treat a corpse with respect. So after, after it dies, we do whatever ritual seems appropriate, but it has to be ritualized. So even people who, say, who will say to me, you know, I'm a skeptic, I'm an atheist, I'm not religious, in fact, from an anthropological perspective are very much religious. They have their beliefs in what's really real and you only have to point to the example of the treatment of corpses. In my, in my society, often people who tell me they're atheistic and so on actually uh, bury corpses of their parents and so on. And this gets back to perhaps the very definition of what it is to be human. Humus, earth, putting a corpse in the earth, treating a corpse with respect. So I bring up this point just to make it clear that anthropology is not about exotic other customs but really about us, about why we have a Friday meal or if you're a Jew or a um, Sunday meal if you're a Christian or why you pray on Fridays if you're a Muslim, what it does to society, how it fits in to the larger economic, political, social and ideological structures within a society. Now, if you're interested in more of these ideas, you can see a, a big discussion on religion in my book, The Entangled State, so please have a look at that. Otherwise, I'll put up the references online. Thanks very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting, and stick, stay tuned for more 25 Concepts in Anthropology.